And now to introduce our two o'clock interfaith lecture series here in the Hall of Philosophy, where this week we're presenting the theme, Moral Leadership in Action. Our distinguished guest today is Ralph Reed. Ralph Reed is founder and chairman of the Faith and Freedom Coalition, a grassroots public policy organization with one million members and supporters with state affiliates in 32 states. In 2014, Faith and Freedom has distributed over 35 million pieces of voter education material through over 500,000 home visits by volunteers and through 140,000 congregations. He is also chairman and CEO of Century Strategies, a public relations and public affairs firm that has advised some of the world's leading corporations. Ralph Reed served as a senior advisor to George W. Bush's 2000 and 2004 presidential campaigns and chaired the Southeast region for Bush Cheney in 2004. As chairman of the Georgia Republican Party, he helped elect the first GOP governor in 134 years and a U.S. Senator and gained, and gained control of the state Senate. Reed has worked on eight presidential campaigns and has advised 88 campaigns for governor, U.S. Senate, and Congress. The Wall Street Journal called him perhaps the finest political operative of his generation. Ralph has na was named one of 20 most influential leaders of his generation by Life Magazine and one of the 50 future leaders of America by Time Magazine. As executive director of the Christian Coalition, he built one of the nation's most effective grassroots public policy organizations with over two million members. He has written or edited six books and, column, and his columns have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and National Review. Ralph serves on the Board of Visitors at the University of Georgia School of Public and International Affairs and the Executive Board of the Northeast Georgia Council of the Boy Scouts of America. He's a member of the Advisory Council of Safe House, a faith-based organization helping the poor and needing. Ralph earned a BA from the University of Georgia and a PhD in history from Emory University, our shared institution in Atlanta. We're very pleased to welcome his wife, Joanne, who's on the porch of the Hall of Mission, and to welcome Ralph and Joanne here to Chautauqua for their very first visit. The title of his lecture today is The Duty of Faith and Citizenship. We're most grateful to the Lewis Raynau Department of Religion Fund for its generous support of today's lecture. Will Lois Raynau please stand now so that we can recognize and thank you for your genera generosity, Lois. Thank you. You'll be pleased to know that Ralph will do a book signing immediately after this lecture over at the Hall of Mission, and that his books will be sold there as well. So I ask you now to please join me in a warm welcome to Chautauqua for Ralph and Joanne Reed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert, for that warm introduction. Thank you for wel welcoming me and my wife Joanne to Chautauqua for our first visit here and it is really indeed a great honor and a privilege for me to be associated with this institution if only for today. For 142 years Chautauqua has represented the finest tradition in American moral and intellectual inquiry. It is a citadel of civil discourse that has enriched the larger culture for most of our nation's history, and its impact radiates far beyond these grounds. It remains one of the most distinguished lecture platforms in our country, having hosted presidents, former presidents, secretaries of state, some of the most important thought leaders in the modern era. And these grounds and this building, steeped in history, and transcendent in the values of mutual understanding and respect that they represent are a bright thread in the beautiful tapestry that is America. And so I'm really proud and honored to be with you today and to join in with some of my previous uh, colleagues and speakers and those who will come after me 
to address such a critical issue as moral leadership in action. It is altogether fitting that we should address this topic here at this place, at this critical crossroads in our history as a nation, just 117 days before the American people go to the polls to choose new leadership for our nation. We do so at a time of unprecedented turmoil in the world, with Britain's exit from the EU enervating both European unity and potentially stability, with the rise of ISIS and other radical Islamic networks sparking terrorist attacks on a seemingly daily basis, with the worst refugee crisis facing the world since World War II, and most recently the United Nations, you may have seen, issued a report in which they related that there were 60 million people in the world today, 60 million who are displaced from their homes, their communities, and their families because of either chaos or war or both. There are hot and cold wars raging in Syria and Libya on the Mediterranean, in the Ukraine and Crimea on the Black Sea, and here at home, we face unique and stubborn challenges of anemic economic growth, of stagnant wages, of a middle class that has not seen its real earning potential after inflation increase in two generations, and in the last several weeks, episodes of racial unrest and violence in our cities that we have not seen in decades. That's the setting. And I don't think that what I've shared is hyperbole. And the leader and leaders that we choose, not just in the realm of politics, but in the marketplace and other arenas in our society will not only confront these challenges, but by their character, the policies they adopt, and the power of their moral example, they will set the tone and help determine the cultural climate of our nation for better or for ill. So this is not an unimportant topic. And today what I wish to talk about is the role that our calling of faith plays in our exercise of our duties as citizens, and more specifically, how to best apply the principles and doctrines in our, of our faith to our civic responsibilities with some particular emphasis on this election now just a few months away. I am on my way to Cleveland tomorrow morning, but I will try not to be partisan. <laughs> I'll try to keep it elevated. Webster, you can applaud that. <laughs> Webster defines morality as action or behavior for which right or wrong, virtue or vice, is imputed from our conduct as social beings in our dealings with one another. So morality is by necessity a social phenomenon. It creates a clear distinction between right and wrong, between justice and injustice. And when an injustice occurs, we often say his or her rights were violated or he had no right to do that. So we can't really discuss morality without discussing our rights and the origins thereof. And in the seminal and defining document of the American experiment, the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson and the framers made what I believe is the most radical statement apart from the Gospels in all of human history rejecting centuries in which the divine right of kings and royal prerogatives ruled human society. Jefferson claimed that we are endowed by our creator, by God himself, with certain inalienable rights. That is to say, rights that are inherent to our very humanity, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and that the sole purpose of establishing government is to protect and defend those rights. Now the grievances in the Declaration are specific and the Bill of Particulars is exhaustive.
They were seeking a bill of divorce from the greatest empire the world had ever known. An empire upon which it was said the sun never set. The greatest military power, the greatest navy, the wealthiest economy the world had ever seen. In the words of Shakespeare, a precious stone set in a silver sea. And they proposed to break that up because they said the government of Great Britain had become morally bankrupt and corrupt and illegitimate because it violated their rights as Englishmen and women and their rights as human beings, which were granted by God, and therefore they could not be denied by their government. And if you read down to the end of the Declaration, they make an even more radical statement. They say that if the government that they are then establishing as they declare their independence ever violates or infringes their rights at any subsequent point, then they will then not only have the right, but they will have the obligation to overthrow that government by force if necessary and establish a new government that will respect their God-given rights. Now this one idea has transformed human history and changed the course and trajectory of society. It has inspired democratic revolutions and democratic movements the world over. And if you remember that incredibly arresting image of the student protesters staring down tanks in Tiananmen Square in 1989 and taking on the brutal communist dictators of their country, they were not holding up copies of the Communist Manifesto or Mao's little red book. They were holding up copies of the Declaration of Independence. Because if we are made in God's image, and if by that act of creation he has given us certain rights that are inherent to our humanity, then every single one of us, regardless of color, race, creed, religion, or ethnic background has a God-given right to their dignity and to respect. The idea held by some at the time, held sadly by some today, believes the opposite, that our rights originate from man and government and that government can take them away. This is the sentiment that Alexander Hamilton rejected when he argued, and I quote, the sacred rights of mankind are written in the whole volume of human nature. They are written by the hand of divinity itself, and they can never be erased or obscured by a mortal power. I worked that Hamilton quote in there for any fans of the Broadway play. It took a Broadway play to save Alexander Hamilton on the $20 bill. <laughs> so it was under the blow of tyranny's hammer that the spark of liberty ignited the flames of revolution. And within 50 years of that moment, the swashbuckling American Republic had so astonished the world with its thriving economy and vibrant society its humanitarian penal system, its low crime rate, its churches and charities, its active local communities, and its very strong educational system that the French government sent Alexis de Tocqueville here in the 1830s to find out exactly what was going on here and what was the secret in the sauce that was America. And de Tocqueville went on to write what I think is the most brilliant and insightful analysis of the American character, not only by any foreign observer, but by anyone in our history. And he, during his visit, he actually came to this part of New York, and he saw revival services overflowing, and saw pur pulpits flaming with righteousness in what later became known as the Second Great Awakening. And he wrote this, he said, despotism may be able to do without faith in God, but democracy cannot. 
He, he was struck by America's religiosity, and he believed that that was the fuel that drove its volunteerism, its communitarianism, and its mutual support for one another. In their wisdom, the founders knew that in the long train of history, liberty was the exception. It was not the rule. The norm in human history, sadly, has been tyranny, bloodshed, and social chaos. So they counseled eternal vigilance and perseverance in defending those rights, even against the government that they had established. You may remember that Jefferson said that it was a good thing for the tree of liberty to be watered occasionally with the blood of tyrants. A fairly politically incorrect statement today, but it gives you a feel for their mindset. John Hancock put it this way. He said, resistance to tyranny is the Christian's duty. Continue steadfast and with a proper sense of your dependence upon God, defend those rights which heaven gave and which no man can take from us. So in the American mind, faith in God, the Christian faith specifically, and the assertion of civic rights became inextricably intertwined. But that wasn't really the raw material for this idea. That came centuries earlier when an itinerant preacher and teacher ministered to the poor in ancient Judea and Samaria in the backwaters of the Roman Empire. And in one of the most striking passages in all of scripture, Jesus is confronted by his critics and makes one of the most remarkable statements of his earthly ministry. The test is found in the gospel according to Mark and it takes the form as it often did of a question from the Pharisees, a very simple question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? You may remember this issue had come up earlier when they had come to Jesus for the poll tax, which all Jews were required to pay to Caesar. And when the disciples came to him, he said, well, should the son of the king be required to pay ta a tax or is he exempt? They said, well, he's exempt. He said, well, go down and catch a fish, pull two coins out, pay mine and yours anyway. So here it's a different question. Because remember at this time, Jerusalem and the Jewish lands were occupied by the Roman government. This was after centuries of the Jews enduring defeat, exile, persecution, and oppression. And not surprisingly, the Jews were praying for and seeking a Messiah who would deliver them from Roman oppression just like Moses had from Egypt. If Jesus said yes to paying the tax to Caesar, he would be exposed as a traitor to his own people. If on the other hand he said no, then he would reveal himself to be a revolutionary and an enemy of Rome deserving of death. So Jesus, as only he could, answered the question with a question of his own. He said, whose inscription and likeness is on the coin? The Pharisee inquisitors said, Caesar's. And he replied, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render to God the things that are God's. Now we can't know for certain, but given the timing of this exchange, more than likely the coin bore the inscription of Caesar Tiberius, who was probably one of the most notorious and brutal dictators in the history of Rome. He was allegedly a pedophile and a moral degenerate. He was a bloodthirsty dictator who executed his political opponents and all the members of their families. And then in, in order to intimidate other people who might oppose him, he would throw their headless corpses into the Tiber River and let them float down so other people could see what happened if you took him on. So in this political context, the Jews being oppressed by a foreign occupying 
power, Jesus was essentially being asked whether or not God's people should pay taxes to occupiers who were led by a brutal and deranged deviant. Now, he declined to associate himself with either side of what was essentially a partisan dispute. In fact, he numbered among his disciples both a member of a violent political party committed to the overthrow of the Roman government, Simon the Zealot, and a tax collector for the Roman Empire. So he drew supporters from both. If he were here today, he would have those on the most far right and the most far left in our political system. What he really did was promulgated a doctrine of dual citizenship. Jesus taught that as people of faith and as followers of Christ, we are citizens of both a heavenly kingdom, which is both here today and yet to come, and we are also citizens of an earthly kingdom. And there are responsibilities in both. In our heavenly kingdom as Christians, we have certain responsibilities to pray, to intercede for others, to read and study the Bible, to attend worship services, to fellowship with other believers, to contribute to our church and other ministries, and to share the good news. In our earthly citizenship, we have corollary responsibilities. In the modern sense, it would be to vote, to be educated and informed. I'm sorry to say this, but to pay taxes, to obey just laws, and to communicate our views to elected officials. Effectively, we hold two passports, one for the kingdom of heaven and the other for the nation in which we, born, we are born or reside or hold our earthly citizenship. And we see a dramatic example of this in the 22nd chapter of Acts, where the Apostle Paul is arrested in, in Jerusalem for sparking a riot when he's preaching the gospel. He's about to be torn limb to limb. And the Roman soldiers who arrest him are about to lay him out, and they've tied him up and strapped him down, and they're about to flog him. And at this moment, the author of the book of Acts records, Paul turns around and says, is it lawful for you to do this to a citizen of Rome? And the soldiers are immediately fearful. They go and grab their commander. They bring him to Paul. And the commander says, you're a citizen of Rome? He said, I paid a lot of money to become a citizen. And Paul says, I was born a citizen of Rome. He is immediately untied, he is freed, and later when his opponents are trying to get him convicted in a kangaroo court and a show trial so that he can be executed, he exercises the most precious right that any citizen of Rome had, a right that we don't even have. He appealed his case all the way to Caesar, and therefore, he was held until he could go to the courts of Rome. And it was by this political act, by this act of asserting a political right, that the gospel message was carried to the very courts of the emperor of Rome. Now, Paul was willing to die for the gospel. He ultimately was imprisoned and gave his life for the cause in which he believed. But interestingly enough, not at the surrendering of the rights that he had as a result of his earthly citizenship. Properly understood what Christ taught and what the early Christians lived was a belief that their civic engagement and their citizenship was really prayer in action. It was a call to conscience. It was a confrontation of evil. It was an assertion of God-given rights, and it was a testimony of God's eternal and overarching sovereignty. That is really what it should be today. Now, we live in troubled times, and today, perhaps more than ever, 
People of faith must use their moral imagination when it comes to the possibilities and the limits of politics. Politics cannot save the lost. It cannot force moral sentiments upon the unregenerate heart. The kingdom of God is never going to be ushered in or established by winning an election or passing a law. Samuel Johnson was right when he said, how small of all that human hearts endure, this part which laws or kings can cure. Still, civic action plays a vital role. It can restrain the wicked, it can protect the innocent and vulnerable, it can provide clear and bright pathways of right and wrong behavior in a free society. It can, in Reinhold Niebuhr's words, bend the arc of history slowly towards justice. This was the case in the struggle for civil rights. From the time that the first slaves arrived on this continent 400 years ago, we have suffered from what Daniel Patrick Moynihan called the racist virus in America's bloodstream. And not only the Civil War with its 600,000 dead, not the Reconstruction uh, constitutional amendments that gave the freed slaves the right to vote and equal protection under the law, not Brown v. Board, not the Civil Rights Acts of 1957 and 1964, not even the election of the first African American president in U.S. history has entirely removed that stain from our society. But the law still matters. As Martin Luther King said, it may be true that a law cannot make a man love me, but it can stop him from lynching me, and I think that's pretty important. Now, some tell citizens of faith to leave their moral beliefs locked in their churches and keep them out of the civic space and the civic arena. What they're really proposing is to create what Richard John Newhouse called the naked public square. They're trying to rob us of one of the most uplifting and edifying aspects of our politics. And thank goodness throughout our history, most people of faith have ignored that advice. From the very beginning of our society, they have poured out of the pews and into the precincts of our politics in order to right wrongs, fired by a sense of justice or injustice, animated by their faith. If we expect leaders in government to provide moral leadership, then we as citizens, as moral actors ourselves, are required to prayfully and thoughtfully choose those leaders. This is a sacred duty. It's what we do at Faith and Freedom Coalition, and we work not exclusively, but primarily among the 27% of the electorate which is self-identified evangelical Christian. Another 10% of voters self-identify as frequently mass-attending faithful Catholics. It's 37% of the electorate, the largest and most dynamic and vibrant constituency in the electorate. And I know that people are saying, well, they're irrelevant, they're just going away, they're yesterday's news. But as Mark Twain once said uh, about a premature obituary written about him, the reports of our death are greatly exaggerated. The problem is, is that not just among voters of faith, but among all voters, there isn't an understanding or an appreciation for this sacred duty. We have, over the decades and centuries, begun to take it for granted. In the late 19th century, 80 to 90 percent of eligible adults voted in the United States. Today, according to the Pew Research Center, there are 61 million eligible adults who are not even registered to vote. And only 57 percent of those who have the right to vote in America will have their shadow darken the threshold of a voting booth in 117 days. But if we check out of this process, 
then we get what we richly deserve. In biblical terms, we will reap what we sow. Abraham Lincoln, who knew a thing or two about politics, said this when he was addressing people who were fed up with the political parties and the politicians. He said, elections belong to the people. It's their decision. If they decide to turn their back on the fire and burn their behinds, then they'll just have to sit on their blisters. <laughs> there are more than a few voters of faith and some with no faith at all that are threatening to sit on their blisters this November. But when I consider those who advocate that we step back from or take a Sabbath from or withdraw from the political fray, I'm reminded of Plutarch's account of Archimedes and his death in the battle over Syracuse. Plutarch relates that while the Romans were sacking the Greek city of Syracuse, this great scientist, arguably the greatest physicist of the ancient era, was so engrossed in his mathematical calculations, drawing his diagrams and his philosophical treatises that he had no idea that the city was being run over. It wasn't until a Roman soldier opened the door of his study that he realized that danger was there. And by then, the centurion prop promptly drove the sword through him. Those of faith, those committed to morality in the broader society, cannot be like Archimedes. We cannot be so immersed and devoted to our spiritual labors and our religious duties that we fail to recognize the danger that is at our very door. We can't be so heavenly focused that we're no earthly good. Now, I'm not saying that these are always easy choices. I remember when I was at the Christian Coalition 20 years ago, we were faced with the distasteful choice in a statewide election in one southern state between two major party nominees, one of whom was a former leader in the Ku Klux Klan, and the other was an ethically challenged politician with a history of accepting bribes and graft. In case you're wondering, we went with the crook. <laughs> the choices are flawed, and sometimes they're maddening. But to do nothing is to acquiesce to injustice. It is to trade the field of battle between good and evil to which we have been called as men and women of faith to the neutral sanctuary of the cheap seats. You know, when Ronald Reagan delivered the famous speech that launched his political career on the eve of the 1964 elections, the title, which I think is fitting for today's topic, was a time for choosing. But among conservatives, it's simply known as the speech. It was the speech that he had refined over years as he traveled the country. And I want to cite just one passage from it. He asked this, should Moses have told the children of Israel to live in slavery? Should Christ have refused the cross? Should the patriots of Concord have thrown down their guns and refused to fire the shot heard round the world? My friends, these are not just rhetorical questions, and it brings us to the matter at hand. In this election, at this time, how should we as men and women of faith exercise our responsibilities as citizens and judge the choices that we have before us? The verdict that we render will not just be on the character of the candidates, it will reveal our own character. This election is not just a window into the soul of those who seek our votes. It is a mirror that reflects who we are. Now, I am of the view that this November we face a binary choice between two candidates. I don't view a write-in vote or a third-party vote as one that is genuinely viable in choosing the next leader. But not everyone in our country is happy about this choice. In fact, a recent survey by the Pew Research Center 
found that 61% of the American people are dissatisfied with the choice of the candidates this November. Anybody else share that sentiment? <laughs> Only one in 10 surveyed said both candidates would make an effective chief executive. But the fact is that on January 20th of next year, one of these two is going to stand on the west front of the Capitol, gaze westward towards the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial, put their hand on the Bible, and they will take the oath to the most powerful office, not only in our land, but of all time. Now, some claim that this is just a choice between two deeply flawed individuals who represent the lesser of two evils, and that men and women in conscience really have no stake in the outcome. They essentially claim to be men and women with no party. I think the exact opposite is true. I think that we cannot sit on the sidelines right now more than any time. And I think to retreat to the cold comfort of the stained glass ghetto, to refuse to muddy our boots with the muck and mire of politics today is simply not an option for someone of faith and moral principles. What we need to do is put away our my way or the highway pride, forsake cynicism, and participate fully, always cheerful, always optimistic, always ready to defend our faith and make the hard choices with which we have been presented by circumstances and I believe by providence. You know, Reagan put it this way as president when he gave one of the most famous addresses he ever gave it as president before the National Association of Evangelicals in 1983. And he said this, beware of the temptation of pride, the temptation of blithely declaring yourselves to be above it all and label both sides as equally at fault. He said to simply declare a pox on both houses and thereby remove yourselves from the struggle between right and wrong and good and evil was a mistake. Now Reagan spoke of the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the West, but he could have just as easily been talking about our own times and the issues that we confront. Now, I believe that the best way to approach this is to judge candidates based not on their religion or theology, but based on their character, their public policy views, and their unique ability to leave, lead and advance those public policy views. Personally, I prefer a candidate who is qualified, capable, and shares my public policy views, but not necessarily my faith to a candidate who shares my faith, but doesn't agree with me on anything and can't lead. I think it was Martin Luther who said, I would rather be operated on by a Turkish surgeon than a Christian butcher. <laughs> That's the way I feel about politicians. <laughs> so in the time that I have remaining, the question is, and I'll posit not necessarily an answer for you, but my own way of thinking about the issues. Which candidate will best promote, not the lesser evil, I reject that formulation, but rather the greater good? And which candidate will ensure the safety of our country and the protection of the God-given rights to which I alluded earlier? Now the right to life is listed first in the Declaration of Independence among these sacred rights. And I do not believe that that was by accident. Because if you don't have your right to life, you can't have any of the other rights if you're not there to enjoy them. And today we live in a nation where the most common surgical procedure is the taking of the innocent life of an unborn child. That is an unspeakable tragedy, not only for the child and for the mother, but for all those in society who will never benefit from that child's gifts and talents and abilities. I thought about this the other night when we were here and heard 
that beautiful voice of the soprano who sang with the orchestra and with the ballet. How many voices have been silenced? How many hands never got to write the book that could have changed your life because they weren't here? I think Mother Teresa spoke the truth when she said, any country that accepts abortion is not teaching people to love, but to use violence to get what they want. And that is why the greatest destroyer of love and peace today is abortion. And I would suggest to you that the contrast between the two major party candidates on that is this issue is the starkest that it has been since Roe v. Wade was decided in 1973. A second issue of importance, not just to voters of faith, but I think all citizens, is our First Amendment rights and especially the freedom of religion and the freedom of speech of a religious content. Recently, the US Supreme Court heard arguments in the case of the Little Sisters of the Poor. This was an order of nuns founded in 1839 that cares for the elderly poor in 30 countries through a network of nursing homes where they provide care entirely free. And these religious women were forced under the Affordable Care Act to provide to their employees under penalty of law medical services and medication, including abortion-inducing medication, that violated their conscience and forced them to act in a way contrary to their faith. The penalties could have totaled up to $70 million a year and would have bankrupted the Little Sisters of the Poor. But it is not just the federal government. These violations of our freedom to express ourselves as men and women of faith are under assault at every level of government. Recently, in my home uh, city of Atlanta, our fire chief, a nationally recognized and decorated fire chief who had turned that department around and had a stellar record of accomplishment, promoted women, promoted gays and lesbians within the department, was not demonstrated to have even a fiber of bigotry in his body, was fired because he ran a voluntary men's Bible study and shared a Christian book at his own expense with employees who voluntarily attended that Bible study. I believe we need a leader and a president who will defend religious freedom. The third critical issue, and this is the issue that I will close with, is the safety and protection of the homeland against the threat of radical Islamic terror. Relatedly, evangelicals also believe strongly in Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. And I believe, given the fact that ISIS has brutally executed 250 young women and girls recently for refusing to be sex slaves to jihadi fanatics and has now executed thousands of priests, preachers, and deeply committed Christians, including many of you may have seen the video on YouTube of them beheading the Coptic Christians that they had uh, captured. We cannot allow this barbarism to spread. And I believe we need a candidate who has, and a president, who has the moral clarity to recognize that this savagery is a great and grave moral evil and must not only be resisted, but be defeated. And I think it is very hard to have that kind of moral clarity when someone has participated in drawing a red line in Syria and then failed to uphold it, now allowing the dictator of that country, Bashar al-Assad, to slaughter over 300,000 innocent civilians, including using chemical and biological weapons. So again, I'm not suggesting that these are perfect choices. We are never going to have perfect choices in a fallen world. What I am suggesting is that when right and wrong are at stake, 
we have to make a choice between those that confront us. Think about the struggle against slavery in William Wilberforce. Wilberforce went after the slave trade incrementally, initially simply abolishing the ability of slaves to be carried on British flagged ships, eventually abolishing the slave trade, and then it wasn't until much later that slavery was abolished in British territories. It took decades of agitation by William Wilberforce to ultimately abolish slavery. And indeed, the final emancipation bill passed in Parliament one month after he had died. He never got to see his life's mission and work accomplished while he was here. But of choosing among men with flaws and imperfections, Wilberforce said this, he said, we have different forms assigned to us in the school of life, different gifts imparted by God. Iron is useful, but it does not sparkle like a diamond. Gold glitters, but it does not have the fragrance of a flower. And so different persons have various modes of excellence, and we must have eyes to them all. Now, you may feel right now what many Americans feel, something that was summed up by a man who I believe was the best friend this country ever had, Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill loved America. You may know that his mother was an American, and he believed that America played a unique and vital role in advancing morality and righteousness in the world. Churchill said this, he said, democracy is the worst form of government ever conceived by the mind of man, except for all the rest. And sometimes you can feel that way in a political season. But as men and women of faith, let us conduct ourselves in such a way that we will be able to say to those who come behind us, to future generations, that this was our finest hour that we kept the faith, that we fought the good fight, and that we did our duty to save this nation, this last best hope for mankind. Thank you all very much, and God bless you. I look forward to taking your questions.